Cam Max, shout out to Cam Max, man. Cam Max, you ain't fucking Cam Max, you ain't fucking Cam Max, man. Cam Max, I want you to shoot. I want you to make fucking Cam Max. You ain't fucking Cam Max, 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 faction of the Crips, one battalion in the Los Angeles Gang Wars. He joined the Crips at age 11 on the day he graduated from the sixth grade. That night, he says he was given a shotgun, and for his initiation, he pumped eight rounds into the ranks of a rival gang. The engagement kill be killed, you know? You say it's a war. Who are the sides? Who's fighting who over what? If it's a war, asking for nothing other than the destruction of human beings. The, the end result is to create funerals. As many souls as you can drop on other side is considered um, success. Uh, my name is Sanyika Shakur. Uh, Monster Cody. Cody Scott. Uh, 56 year old, long standing member of the Crips. First generation A Trey. I founded the north side of the A Trey Gangster Crips in 1980. Um, I've been a combatant in that war, which catapulted me to local stardom, a celebrity status in our area, South Central from just basic atrocities, you know what I mean? Nothing that really, you know, uh, you know, caused me to think or sit down and solve a problem. I always was adding on to the problem. So, you know, we we'll get to that, but I was one of them dudes, you know what I'm saying? Front line, and, uh, but I learned from cats. I, I, I didn't just materialize out of thin air. I didn't fall from the sky. I was produced by a certain climate in a certain area in certain dirt man in the tropics of destitution this is where i was produced which is where other plants before me were produced and just, we just came up as cactuses and we didn't need much what everybody else needed you didn't have to water us but every three years i mean we just existed in a fucking desert of nothing but just poverty and just our elders not overstanding that just Something was going on with us as people. We couldn't articulate it. I don't think the cats before us could because the way they reacted, it was not just in rebellion to the system and the pigs and the whole American thing, but it was also in rebellion to the Panthers who had established something that was about unity. So these young cats, the Keyways, and then eventually the Damus, these was now the front line vanguard of me this is where i was looking when they was looking at maybe huey or bunchy carter or craig munson craig credit cats from the east raymond before him and two hooked up man who i am man is a product ball at so in 1972 december my mother moved from the crenshaw district to 69th and dinker and it's something about this area, man. This is just a dynamic area. This whole little area, I'm talking about between Manchester, 
and Slauson between Crenshaw and Normandy is something about this area. Out of this one area, five people have written books. Five people have written books out of this area. But not just that, out of this area on the west side of South Central, connecting streets to Florence and Normandy. This little area right here was really the command center of the West Side Crips. St. Andrews Park was the center of the West Side Crips Park. We, the H Rays inherited that. This shit that the H Rays got, that we got now, that we've been fighting 60s for, for 40 years, man. We inherited it. The war with the 90s was inherited to us through our relation with the Hoovers, but also as a consequence of us claiming St. Andrews Park. St. Andrews Park never got along with Sportsman Park. The Sportsman Park boys was the enemies of St. Andrews Park. So Tookie, Cukes, Rusty, Mouse, Todd, Chucky Madison, Gary Lane. I mean, these dudes were using their whole names. I mean, these dudes was like rambunctious, serious giants. This is what I inherited. This is who I am. So my mother moved us to 70, in 72, she moved us to 69th Dinger. And I'm seeing these cats. I'm seeing Rusty hit the corner every day. I'm seeing Q's hit the corner every day in 64, Riviera. With the truck lights under the wheel wells, with the wheel well painted white, with the Kragers, the little 20s, and him leaning with the 8-track, probably holding it with his hands so he, so he can keep the same song going. But, but just that visual. You see how boys in the hood or men's society slow shit down when they, they see a gangster walking in the, or the news will slow you down when they want to make you look particularly atrocious. Like they'll, they'll say, today, Cody Scott murdered 12 people and was captured. But they'll show me coming out of court and I'll be saying to my wife, hey babes, I'll talk to you tomorrow. But they'll slow it down there and it'll look like this. <laughs> And then they'll be saying, and Cody Scott killed 12 people and he's been captured. You see it, they'll make you, so your visual ain't lining up with what you're hearing, but the hearing is more evil. And the way you're going, you can't be saying nothing cool, look at your face. But they slowed the footage down. And you look like you're frowning, but you're just really passing the love note. What I'm saying is, point, a point of view, right? The point of view from which I got of seeing these cats was like a jump for me from um, World War II movies that was popular at that time when I came up. Rat Patrol, uh, 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 Combat with Vic Morrow. Those are the dudes I wanted to be like because they was rough and tumble dudes, but I only seen them on TV. And then before them, the bullshit cowboy movies, the genocide movies, you know, with John Wayne swaggering his ass up in there. John Wayne swagger his ass up in some shit. And this motherfucker's just got testosterone all on the wall and shit. Right? I mean, this motherfucker, this motherfucker was leaking man. Right? But that's the image they wanted to portray of the American people, American male at that time. So that's where I got my, my, my whole get down of what it was like to be upright, to be, you know, not just able to do it, but able to protect people too. Cause I never liked bullies, man. I never liked, I never liked the bullies, right? Cause I was being, at that time I was being bullied. So explain to me who were some of the older Crips you looked up to in your, your area when your mom's well, moved? Well, yeah, I moved into, I moved into the fucking, I moved into fucking uh, uh, central casting for what today is the prototypical, what today is, uh, the archetypical gangster. I moved into that and that was just the norm. And, and these cats, but they had their own style. They wore leather like the, the Panthers, but they really wasn't about black power. These dudes out getting pussy. These dudes was carrying guns. They was just doing what they wanted to do. They were outlaws. They were outside of the law. And that's what the appeal was. So when I came from them bullshit ass movies and all that, and actually move there and would be in the front yard and Q's them be up and down the street or they'd be chasing Brims or Brims would be chasing them up and down Dinker. I mean, just 
but, but they would do it with style and finesse, man. So they became the real deal. And fuck being like somebody on TV that I ain't even the same color as. I want to be like the dude who's the real deal. Do you remember some of those brands' names? Oh, yeah. Yogi, Terry Cadeau, uh, his brother, uh, uh, that son of a bitch. He, he really wasn't the bank, but he used to, he used to really uh, support him a lot. I, I'll think of his name. Oh, Touche, uh, Michael Silverstein. You know, these dudes are uh, uh, fucking Foots, fucking uh, Rat, Twins, son of a bitches. Even, you know, like, here's the thing with me. I, I came into the Crips, so I, I was fortunate enough, man, to, to be pollinated like that, man. And I was fortunate enough that, that righteous ass fucking butterflies and fucking bees fucking landed on me, man, and pollinated me, man, cross pollinated me. And I was able to rub shoulders with giants, man, because I learned how Cripping is and how it and everything changes. I ain't no stuck dude going back talking about let's take it back to the days because the good old days was really the bad old days. Every day has their good days and every every time has their good and bad days. There wasn't no good old days all the time. You know, the, the mother of invention is necessity is the mother of invention. If you need it as a human with all this knowledge and prehensile and holding thumbs, we will create it. I need to see people in a box running through a fucking electrical cord through a copper cable. I need to control that. Now, they didn't know all that then. But when that dude walked up to them and said, I'm going to build this thing called television, they said, get the fuck out of here. You're going to put people in a fucking box, put the fucking cord in the wall socket, and then run an antenna on the roof to show it? Get him out of here, Jim. Now, today they got TVs fucking thin as my phone. You feel me? Fucking big as this fucking patio. What I'm saying is, if you need it, you'll produce it. So, street organizations where I was from, gangs, fulfilled the need. The Panthers have been wiped out. And these brothers and sisters, everybody always say, may have been Panthers. That's true or not true. Well, I tell you what they were. They was tired of the bullshit. And the way they responded to it by creating this super gang, which they never thought was going to be a super gang, it was just cats doing their thing. That's what people don't understand about history, man. History ain't plotted out. That ain't the part that's going to make history when you plot that shit out. History is spontaneous, man. It's made by the masses every day. Small shit that you never hardly hear about. But we're hearing about more because now we take knowledge, you know, not knowledge to Mature. And, and I apologize, man, for, for straying off again, but man, it's been so long since I've been able to talk. Oh, it's all good. So, it's, Tookie, tell, tell me how and when you met Tookie. I, I first met Tookie in 76, man. And, um, this is before he moved on 69. His father, his stepfather, always lived there. And uh, he was a photographer. And then Huge and his mother lived around the corner. And not not his mother, but you know, not Q's mother. Um, took his uh, mother had the dog thing. Remember, she had the the, the kennel uh, in Compton. So Took was doing that at that time, and uh, he came over here with Jack, and uh, from the east side, who became his roommate eventually. And they asked me uh, where Took's father was, stepfather was, and I said I didn't know. But they had a red '64 Chevy for Lou Took. He was finna get out of YA. And um, they asked me what I thought about the car. I said, I thought it was cool, man. So I rode off, I was on my bike. That was the first time I ever really met him. But I already, I already knew, his, I knew who he was by sight, by his shape, you know, by just the way people were around him. You know, he just, and, 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 he, and his thing about Tookie, Tookie never was like the leader. He just was just one of the hardest motherfuckers. And motherfuckers was just on that level getting hard. So who else better to emulate than the hardest motherfucker there? But Took, he, he himself was emulating Craig Munson. The thing was to try to be a giant. The thing was that when I hit you, I'm gonna knock you out. I don't got time to be fight, fighting with you all day. My biscuits is shined up. 
my, my, I got my creases in, I got the vest on, you know what I mean? I got my ace dudes, I got the motherfucking, it's hooked up. I ain't got time to be fighting with you. I got this long cross earring in. When I hit you, I'm going to knock you out. So in order for me to do that, I got to lift weights. So Tukey was the, the, the prototype of that for us. But he himself was the as we all overstand, right? Tukey used to have a big old picture of Sergio Olivia, and it, a Cuban brother who won Mr. Olympia. First brother ever to do it, an African Cuban. And uh, so everybody had something to look up to, man. But um, so, but, but you had Tukey, right? But Tukey wasn't all wasn't the biggest. There was other cats bigger than Tukey, but they didn't have the whole package. Bigger than what? Reputation or size? And size. No, 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 no one bigger than and then rep. See, once the rep is established, then that's what you you ride on, right? And then more not more time out of ten, when you, when you approach people, are approaching you based on your rep. So that that floats you for a while, but. Tookie's like cutes, like all of us. The rep ain't cool. I, I need to fight every day. So that's how Tookie was. He just pull up and just want to fight a motherfucker. You know what I mean? So he he wasn't always the biggest, but he had the whole total package, the whole charisma. Man, look, bro. And I'm not just saying this because I'm Keyway and Took is a Keyway, and I knew him personally. But he was star quality, man. Just like Mouse. These these cats, man. In, in any other lane. In this country, if freedom existed, these dudes would be who everybody would be. These dudes would be our Billy D. Williams. They would be our James Earl Jones. These dudes, I'm talking about the total package. Intelligence, wit, charm, unbridled sexuality, uh, physique, looks, teeth. I mean, these dudes, no tattoos. They'd have to do none of that. They didn't have to look when you see these dudes, they might just do something as esoteric as this. Just throw their wing out on you. Ain't nobody seen this but you and this dude. But he just did flexed on you. Now it's about Virgin Swan and going to Long Beach and catching him at the Long Beach arena for the uh, Parliament Funkadelic concert. We're gonna break on him. Come out on him, Tookie. Break on him, Tookie, break on him. That's what Big Jack would say. Break on him, Tookie. And Tookie would come out of shit. No tattoo, waist this small. Come out like this, man. I mean, I'm a, just a giant of a dude. Handsome, big old natural. At the height of health. Taking no supplements or nothing, man. Man, Took would do this shit. All boys to the side on the set. Took would go up to the liquor store and buy a half pint of chocolate milk. Go right around the other aisle and get a little box, a little packet of yeast. He take the yeast and eat the yeast and drink the chocolate milk on way back home and say, "I'm finna go out to the house and blow up like bread." And he he start lifting because it was my job to stack the weights. Me, Harv, Lil Harv, um, Trey Ball. It was our job to stack the weights. So if he say he doing arms that day, we get the arm shit out, dumbbells. You know how the whole front room took his whole front room was no furniture, all weights. That cute, I mean that, um, uh, you know, the other homies had went around and, and, and taken from areas and people. So it took his whole front room was weights. You want to sit down, you sit down on a stack of 50s. Or you sit down on that crate, but in that crate it's like a dang gang of dimes and mirrors. And a crate with a box, with a, a speaker in it that was hooked to a line that went to the back that was supposed to be an eight track, but it only played four songs, a four track. So they played four songs over and over all day. Girl Call It by Chocolate Milk. Reach For It by George Duke. Happy Feelings by Frankie Beverly and Maze. And Go Away Little Boy by Marlena Shaw. Now this song here made it into the repertoire because Big Jack, Took's roommate, who's the OG East Side Crip, swole at the top, but he had little bitty chicken legs. That's the homie, but that was his weakness. He had the proverbial, despicable me body, like uh, the penitentiary body. That, you know, people, before people start working on their legs, overstanding that the legs is your foundation. And I'm getting off this, man. I'm on stuff. <laughs> hey, brother, look, look, hey, 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 h
Hey. Man, I'm so happy to be out the hole. I'm so happy to be out solitary confinement. I'm so happy to be back on the main line. Because when I, I mean, man, bro, I got validated in 1989. I got validated, right? Validated as what? As an associate of the Black Will family. But at that time, it didn't matter. Associate member, you validated, that's the rap. So from 89, to 2017, I had an indeterminate shoot, shoot term. Every time I got captured, when they put the handcuffs on, I knew I'd, I'd go straight to reception, straight back to Pelican Bay. And that's what happened. So I was there doing the hunger strikes 2011. And um, I got released in 2012, San Diego. But look, when I went back this time, this case was, our, our, our hunger strike was successful. And we won the, uh, well, we settled the Asker versus the governor decision about us being captured as political prisoners in whole with no 115s. You said we belong to this group, but we ain't got a 115. You just came and locked us up and said we're a threat to the institutional security. And all of a sudden, I got life in the hole. You know, the judge only gave me five years. You giving me life in the hole for no crime. Your threat. Okay. I went back this time. They lifted that. Boom, I'm on the main line. Ooh. I'm on the main line. Level three. Sentinel. That shit was shocked to my system. Like, fuck. It was like being on the street. I had seasoning and shit in my food and shit. I had a hot pot. Hey, cause I came out the hole. Because when I first got back, they put me straight in, in Chino's hole. Until they lifted my indeterminate in like six months. Then lift the indeterminate, and then uh, send me over to level three, 37 points or some shit. But, so I kind of came out the hole, I didn't have shit. So everybody gave me everything, TV, you know, fan, hot pot, all that shit. I was amazed, I had so much shit, I didn't know where to plug it at. I said, damn, they got plugs and everything. I had been in the hole so long, it's like I was a caveman. It was a trip. But they wouldn't give me a celly for a year. So I stayed there a year. Boom, then I went to Solano. Solano was, I never met so many young Crips, so many young Bloods, so many young barrier dudes, so many young barrier Crips. That was just, they had so much time. And really that's the key, man. I think that we're missing on, on this whole prison thing. Yeah, they let a lot of lifers out. But they let a lot of lifers out because they've sucked them dry. They've sucked them dry. Now these young brothers and sisters that's coming in with all these this time, that's the new generation. And then once they get enough of them in, they're gonna change the law again, boom. Where well, they gonna be locked in for a certain amount of time. It's like a revolving door. It's like the recidiv it's like the the system has recidivism. The system itself can't reform. The system itself has to eat from us. And, and, and really, isn't that how it, it, it is like? Like really at the bottom of this whole apparatus, on the bottom level, is the real oppressed people. The Chicano nation, New African nation, Puerto Rican nation, indigenous people, Alaska, Hawaii. These is really the foundations of what America's resting on. Because this is where she reaps her benefits from, really. Then it has this bullshit working class, you know, white people in their bullshit ass unions, like that shit means something. And um, fucking unions were busted back in the fucking 20s. All oh, that shit's corrupt, right? But it, it's, it's, this, this country is the Ponzi scheme and it's predicated on our backs. So if you jump back to what you were saying about the street organization, I was a young impressionable child. I knew right from wrong. I had been tongue kissing girls and humping them and sticking my finger in their butt for years. And I was, when I was eight, I had started probably doing that when I was five. You know, curiosity with girls, you know, my age and shit. You know how you were young and shit, you're humping the girls and shit. But so I, so I wasn't no naive ass dude. I knew that if I shot a dude, he wasn't gonna get back up. I knew that kind of shit. I had never shot a gun, but I had been seeing it on the cowboy movies and all the fucking war movies. And then I had been, I learned my violence from um, Looney Tunes. Man, I learned how to hit a motherfucking head with a board from, um, 
Daffy Duck with a nail in it. I learned how to carry two guns from Yosemite Sam. Um, I learned how to carry a double barrel shotgun from Elmer Fudd. Um, I mean, did, 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 I learned how to do a drive-by from watching Al Capone movies. I, I was a young, impressionable dude. So then moving down to 69th, and mom thought she was doing the right thing by getting us a bigger house. She moved us from the fucking frying pan to the fire. And she ain't overstanding because she's just a working class mother by herself with six kids. And um, we took advantage of that shit. We went, we went latch key like a motherfucker. I, I, I went to Raymond Avenue for one week. Crazy D and my homeboy Gay Gay jumped on me. We, we, none of us from the set then, but a dude across from me asked me if I wanted this hot dog. I didn't know he was already beefing with Crazy D. So I said, yeah, so when I reached for the hot dog, him and D beefing, so D think I'm with him, so D get off on me, boom. Then Gay Gay jump in, they they, they pack me out. Now, I, I, I took care of it later, don't trust me. But, um, um, okay, so I, I say, fuck it, I lock it up. I leave that school, and I go back to the school, I, I was over in the Crenshaw District, 54th Street. And it was from that school I graduated, sixth grade. But in sixth grade, I joined the turf. Okay, now you go to Horseman after that? Yeah, I go to Horseman, seventh grade. Whole seventh grade, I'm a Horseman. So 76, 77, I'm a Horseman. But the last day of school at Horseman, 76 turning 77, right around the time me took, I slapped the Dean on the back of the neck on the way down the stairs. He was standing there, at the, it was the last day of school on Friday. And I couldn't, I, I had to get his neck. This motherfucker was standing there with his corduroy fucking shirt, I mean, jacket on with the patches and shit, with his hand like this, like some authority ass figure, motherfucker. And I was going downstairs and I didn't think he was gonna see me, so I reached back and got him. Bam! Slapped the shit out of him. I gave him the whole hand on his white ass neck. Bam! And I dug down the crowd and I jetted. But the whole summer that fool hunted me and got all his informants. Then the first day of school, he was at the gate. And he said, Cody Scott, come here. Come on, grabbed him by the shoulder, took me in, expelled me. Not expelled me from the school district, you know, suspended me. So, and kicked me out of school. I went to Henry Clay. And this is how I hooked up with the Hoovers. I went to Henry Clay, 77. So, I landed Henry Clay, just so happened they put me in the, in the fucking uh, 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 class with Ben Oves from 107, Levi from 107, Moo little brother on Andre Jones from 107. I mean, some solid dudes, because I really didn't know who was from blocks or neighborhoods, because that ain't who we was beefing with. This is like 77, and it wasn't no Crip Wars. I'm still over enthused by these giants, like Cutes, Rusty, Mouse, Tub, Chucky, Todd. I mean, you know, fuck, man. Lil Tub, Wayne. Uh, loose Booty, T-Bone, All Head Bobby, KC. I mean, these dudes is local. Raymond Potts, James Miller, the Bram Killer. I mean, these is fucking local fucking legends, right? And so these names is like, to me, like collecting baseball cards. And I would see their name on the wall and it'd say Cukes, 38 Special. He signed his name and then put the kind of gun. But the thing about them was they, they had a clique called the Magnificent Seven. 